we don't expand our imagination, justification for being what you are. And welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm Bill Plant. President Obama met with executives from BP today, finally, and discussed, among other things, establishing a $20 billion fund to compensate victims of the Gulf Coast oil spill. He outlined this compensation fund in a statement made a few minutes ago. Take a look. Bill, uh, this $20 billion uh, will provide substantial assurance the claims people and businesses have will be honored. It's also important to emphasize this is not a cap. Uh, the people of the Gulf have my commitment that BP will meet its obligations to them. BP has publicly pledged to make good on the claims that it owes to the people in the Gulf. And so the agreement we reached sets up a financial and legal framework to do it. Another important element is that this $20 billion uh, fund will not be controlled by either BP or by the government. It will be put in an escrow account administered by an impartial, independent third party. So if you or your business has suffered an economic loss as a result of this spill, you'll be eligible to file a claim for part of this $20 billion. This fund does not supersede either individuals' rights or states' rights to present claims in court. And BP will also continue to be liable for the environmental disaster it has caused, and we're going to continue to work to make sure that they address it. So, with his address last night and his actions against BP, is the president finally taking charge of the crisis? And is it enough? With me to discuss, Ken Vogel, senior reporter for Politico. Ken, the White House has been talking endlessly for the last two days about this being an inflection point their favorite phrase. Is it? Well, it's an inflection point. They certainly hope it's one to the extent that they will no longer be talking about this sort of absence of leadership that uh, critics have alleged that Obama has shown in this situation. What they're hoping to do is turn the page and talk more about uh, the energy legislation that Democrats have uh, put forward in Congress that has kind of been stalled that uh, President Obama in his address last night said uh, should now be a priority because this oil, uh, this oil leak has shown uh, that our uh, dependence on oil in particular, foreign oil, uh, deep water drilled oil uh, it is, is not healthy, potentially catastrophic. Uh, what he did is what he could do. He uh, used the bully pulpit to pressure Congress, and then today he met with BP and extracted an agreement. Again, it's an agreement. They agreed to do this. He's not telling them what to do. And these are the paths that he has open to him to sort of show that he's on top of this issue. Right. But as many people have already pointed out, um, there wasn't anything that the president could really do very much. Uh, so he coupled this to what he would like to do going forward with energy. Do you think it works? I'm not sure if it does. I mean, there was a recent poll by the Associated Press that came out yesterday that showed that Americans are dissatisfied with his leadership and uh, on this issue. But again, his hands are tied. There's not a lot that he can do. So he's using the, the, the sort of uh, uh, avenues that are open to him. Uh, and, and one of those includes communication. He's, he's trying to appear to be on top of this by relaying new information to the American public, even if it is not information about anything that he has ordered or decreed, but rather an agreement that he has struck uh, with BP. And so, again, these are, these are the things that he can do. He's doing them, whether it's enough remains to be seen. So, as uh, we both observed, at the beginning, the president tried to stay away from this, wanted to uh, let BP handle it, didn't want to get involved. Did he wait too long to become involved? Well, th that's certainly the knock on him. But uh, when you compare it to, I mean, a lot of people compare it to uh, uh, former President Bush's response to Katrina. Certainly that's one where you could allege that there was uh, that government inaction or lack of attention proved to worsen the situation. In this case, I don't know that you can make that case, but he's clearly trying to avoid that comparison. Another interesting historical point of comparison that I think uh, both Bush's response to Katrina and President Obama's response here show that politicians have learned from is the 1927 Mississippi River flood, where then President Calvin Coolidge steadfastly refused not just to go to the area where so many thousands of people were struggling and in fact put into Red Cross relief camps, 
but refused to call Congress back into session to address the uh, the broken levees and the, the infrastructure that would be needed to be repaired in the area. Uh, his popularity tanked as a result. His Commerce Secretary at the time, Herbert Hoover, was his point man on this. He spent a lot of time down there in the Mississippi River Valley that was affected by this uh, catastrophic flood. His popularity soared. He won the Republican nomination for president. Of course, eventually the White House when Coolidge decided not to seek it. So that's sort of an extreme example of what inattention and inaction by a president to a crisis can do. Uh, clearly, President Obama is, is nowhere near going that route. No, but at the same time, uh, President Obama tried very hard to avoid this at the very beginning. And there was from the beginning, almost from the beginning, a demand that he do something, even though if you look at it rationally, you'd say, okay, what can the government do? And people would say, well, call out the Navy, do something. And that reaction, I guess, is something that all presidents should expect. Yeah, and, and it's uh, one that he has dealt with to the uh, extent uh, that he has been able through the channels that are available to him. And there are always going to be those critics who are alleging, who, who will allege that his, he was not uh, quick enough or his, his response was not uh, activist enough. Of course, there's a little bit of irony there that some of the Republicans who are alleging, who are leveling this criticism, are those who, uh, for many months prior to this, have alleged that his uh, his government, the Obama administration, has been overreaching in its application of of government authority. And then now you have uh, sort of even further down, if we could extrapolate even further, where one of the channels that President Obama did take, urging Congress to act to pass comprehensive energy legislation, uh, Republicans are saying, well, this is him trying to capitalize. Sure, they say it smacks of political opportunity. That was the that was the Republican reaction after the speech last night. Sure, and th there is certainly an element of that. And uh, I, I think that his defenders would say, well, sometimes it takes a crisis to uh, get government sort of off a dime, get them to move on something, and this would certainly qualify. Uh, he was also criticized a bit for making an analogy to 9/11, saying that after 9 this. This should be to our energy policy what 9-11 was to our security policy. In other words, a wake-up call that we need to do more, do something differently. He said that to our Roger Simon in an Oval Office interview. Republicans said, hey, why is he comparing this to 9-11? To that really smacks of political opportunism. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that's the case he was trying to make. Nonetheless, this is sort of an example that no matter what President Obama does in this situation, he is going to be open to criticism. So bottom line, uh, maybe... We have to wait and see how well the compensation thing works, and that's going to take a while because they have to set up the standards for claims and a number of other things. So it doesn't look like anybody's going to be seeing money anytime real soon. That's right. All this stuff is going to take a while from the oil spill commission that he set up, which is going to come back in six months with uh, sort of technical recommendations for preventing future spills like this to the escrow account, the disbursement of the $20 billion from the escrow account. So none of this is, is really uh, going to provide President Obama that true inflection point that he is seeking where he can put this crisis behind him. Instead, it's going to drag out. In many ways, uh, what Congress was able to do uh, yesterday in dragging these oil executives before it to kind of berate them, in many ways that is more satisfying for the public to see because it's, a, it's sort of an expression of their own frustration with this situation and with these oil companies. President Obama can't really do that, so instead he uses uh, an Oval Office meeting with, uh, with the uh, BP executives and he uses his ability to uh, call on Congress to act on this energy legislation. And that's sort of his version of, uh, of, of expressing the public outrage over this. Well, at least, Ken, he didn't say anything about kicking butt. Exactly. Time. Ken Vogel, Politico, thanks very much. Thank you. In May of 2008, the California Supreme Court overturned laws banning same-sex marriage. Opponents of same-sex unions then organized, and they put a referendum on the November ballot that year to amend the state constitution to say that marriage could only be between a man and a woman. It was called Proposition 8, and it passed with 52% of the vote. Now there's a constitutional challenge underway. A judge in California is hearing final arguments in the case today. Prop 8, as it's called, was backed heavily by the Mormon Church. And Stephen Greenstreet co-directed a documentary called 8, The Mormon Proposition. It's about the church's campaign to pass Prop 8, and I spoke with him earlier and asked about...
the significance of the church's involvement in this controversial case. Take a look. As we were doing our research, um, we uncovered that California is not the first state that the Mormon Church has done this. They have a 50-state campaign. They have a, 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 a um, doctrinal reason for fighting this. Um, they got involved in Hawaii in the, in the late 90s, where they realized that in the public they weren't that popular over church. And so what they did is they went out to other churches that were popular, the Catholic Church, the Evangelicals, and said, look, we have lots of money and we have a powerful grassroots campaign. Uh, we'll fund this if you guys front this for us. And so they organized in Hawaii, Hawaii's Future Today, and then in California, the National Organization for Marriage, which many people don't know is the Mormon Church. If you pull back the curtain, the man behind it is the Mormon Church. They've since gone into Maine to uh, ban gay marriage there. And so the Mormon Church essentially has been doing this and will continue to do this until people tend to realize who's really, really behind this. So what's your message in the, in the doc? I mean, what are you trying to say? Because people are always uh, advocating positions right. uh, for and against this kind of legislation. Well, I, ser I grew up Mormon myself, and I served a Mormon mission and was sent out by a church to knock on doors to spread a message of tolerance and charity and love. And I saw that same church going to California with a complete lack of those ethics. And that on, it, on, on its head, people, I, I was shocked as a member, I'm a member of the Mormon church, that my church would do this. But also, people need to realize that what happened in California was a campaign of misinformation, lies, and fear. And I do not believe voters went to the ballot box with the right information. And uh, for example, saying that um, if gay marriage passes and is allowed in California, religions won't be able to practice religion, uh, their religion as they should, that they'll be forced to accept gay marriage and perform gay marriage in their churches, which is a flat out lie. And so I wanted to make this film so that the next time voters go to the ballot, they go with the right information and they know what they're really voting for. So what was the general reaction to the debut, which was at Sundance, right? Yeah, we premiered just miles away in Utah uh, from church headquarters. And, you know, going out to Sundance, we had a couple preconceptions that, you know, we were going to be chased out of town or um, there were going to be angry protests. And Mormons actually came, active Mormons came to the screenings. And afterwards, with tears in their eyes, engaged in open conversations because the film really is about universal human emotions. It's about love and caring and, and families being torn apart. And no one wants to see that. And so for the Mormons who have seen this film, it's been a very positive experience of finding common ground. The uh, Washington Post tried to get some comment from the Mormon church about the doc. And uh, the church response, according to the Post, was that though they hadn't seen it, it was obviously biased. Now, uh, why do they respond that way? I don't know. You know, I saw that statement also. They issued that statement right before Sundance. And, you know, the church wants to downplay this. They told us that we're just hoping this all dies down. We're hoping that the public becomes complacent and just forgets about this issue because it really has garnered them a lot of bad press. Now, I, I find it funny that in one paragraph they say we haven't seen the film and then the next say it's biased and, and lacking in truth. Um, that's obviously a pretty silly thing to say. Um, I, I hope they see the film. We invite them to come and see the film, and I'd love to have a conversation with them. So let me, let me ask you this. In the film, do you sort of scapegoat them for what they believe or just for the way they acted? Well, you know, it, you have to understand that their motivations, first and foremost, of why they do what they do. And, and, and it is founded in their doctrinal beliefs that, you know, m all men have the capability of becoming gods like God himself and that they will um, arise to a, a Mormon heaven with their polygam with many wives and create their own worlds and populate those worlds with their own spirit children. And when a gay baby pops up, it disrupts not only their plan for heaven, but the, the structure of the entire universe. And so they do attack this from a doctrinal standpoint and um, they, they involve their members in, in that and so like the, while they won't say publicly that they believe in polygamy after this life and, and they, that they believe in um, you know they don't teach from the prophet actively that men can become gods but that really is the deep-rooted issue here. okay so do their doctrine is their doctrine but right. what uh, what are you taking them to task for in the film the, not, the doctrine or the way that they opposed Prop 8. Right, and or, you have is, to lay out. Oppose, but yeah, or, you have to lay out what they believe for, first and foremost to understand why they do what they do. But we take them to task for two things. One, 
the amount of money that they that they dumped into California was overwhelming, and it was uh, they ran a completely insidious political campaign whereby they they cooked the books, underreported. At, at when they first reported, they first claimed they spent no money in California, and then uh, since then, you know, just this week, the Fair Political Practices Commission indicted them with 13 counts of, of lying and underreporting on their financial contributions uh, for Proposition 8. And so they flat out lied. And, and we knew this from the get-go. Uh, growing up Mormon, I knew what was going on. Fred Carger, one of the main political analysis in, in our film, filed the complaint. And uh, you know, we're, we're grateful that the indictments have come down, but I'm pretty sure we have more to, there's more to come. There's more to be revealed. Okay, the film goes into release Friday, right? The film will be released this Friday in theaters and then online on iTunes and Netflix. And we're hoping, I hope every voter sees this film. That's really who this is for. It's for the audience. It's for the voters who, um, you know, when, when, when those rights were shipped away from those couples uh, who just wanted to love each other in California, I want the voters to understand who is behind the curtain and who is really behind uh, the, this machine, this political machine that's, that's doing this state by state by state. All right. Stephen Greenstreet, co-director of Name Eight. the Film. Eight the Mormon Proposition. Eight the Mormon Proposition. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Finally today, the State Department re released its annual Trafficking in Persons report. The big news is that for the first time, the United States has included itself in the annual ranking of offenders. The report also clarifies the major forms of human tracking from forced labor to sex trafficking. It's a crisis that affects over 12 million people worldwide, and our Christina Ruffini has more with this report. Take a look. In its 10th annual report on human trafficking, the State Department named names. But for the first time, the United States also named itself. For the first time ever, we are also reporting on the United States of America uh, because we believe it is uh, important to keep the, the spotlight on ourselves. Although it ranked among the nations doing the most to combat the practice, trafficking in the United States is still a big problem one that largely goes unnoticed. What we have in the United States is a situation where there are homegrown traffickers who are enslaving um, people in various segments of the economy. And some of those uh, end up enslaving American citizens. Some of those end up enslaving foreign nationals. Most of the activity involves forced labor, with hotels, construction sites, nail salons, and strip clubs among the leading offenders. We hope that the media are, is going to take more time to uh, highlight this issue. The State Department has identified this 14,500 to 17,500 range, um, but um, most people agree that this is just a very rough estimate, and we really do not know. But the report also identifies several special cases, including Haiti, where the demolished government infrastructure made orphaned and displaced children especially vulnerable to human smuggling operations. With about a half a million children who are now orphaned or who are um, victims of the earthquake itself in Port-au-Prince, you can imagine that these children are um, very vulnerable to being um, put into more exploitive situations. But even in nations with strong, stable governments, violators are hard to find and even harder to prosecute, with the global conviction rate of identified cases just under 9 percent. What we don't necessarily see yet is the decrease in victims. Last year it was estimated that about 12.3 million men, women and children fell victim to human trafficking, making it one of the largest criminal enterprises in the world, second only to drugs and arm trade. Christina Ruffini, CBS News, Washington. Thanks to Christina and thanks to all of you for watching Washington Unplugged. You can catch all of the latest news on the disaster in the Gulf right here on CBSNews.com. I'm Bill Plant. Have a great day.